huge welcome to everyone uh, here today that's joining us. Uh, my name is Amber Hester. I'm a lead learner with Jigsaw Learning, and I couldn't be more excited to be the, the first person to welcome you to the uh, Collaborative Response Symposium 2021. We have uh, the 26th, 7th, 8th, and 9th uh, full jam-packed of uh, different sessions uh, for everyone, and we are just thrilled to have those of, you who, those of you here with us right now joining us and so looking forward to seeing all of our um, partners, friends, um, new colleagues, new faces, and, and the, having the opportunity to build some, some more connections across uh, our great country and our province and even internationally. Um, just so everyone knows, the, the session is being recorded today. We do have uh, 221 participants registered so far and people representing 50 different districts and or organizations from across Alberta, Saskatchewan, British Columbia, Iceland, and Australia. And I know if we were in one big room, we'd all hear some huge cheers for uh, each of the different provinces and areas that I just mentioned. So we uh, would like to begin today with our, our land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional meeting grounds, gathering place, and traveling route to the Cree, Soto, Blackfoot, Dene, Nakota Sioux, and the traditional homeland of the Métis. We acknowledge all of the many First Nations, Métis and Inuit, whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. We are aware and we are honored that some of our participants are joining us from other treaty areas and Métis zones in Alberta and Canada as well. So welcome to everyone. And uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Jen. Thank you. So I'm Jennifer Ferguson. I'm a digital learning liaison with Jigsaw Learning. And my role here today is to talk you through a little bit of the symposium site. So the symposium site will be available until July 1st, 2021. And that is where you will have access to all of the pre-recorded sessions, any of the recorded live sessions that we have, and any of the resources that we've made available as part of that. And so if we take a look at where those pre-recorded sessions are, you'll notice that they are coordinated by category. Uh, on the main page, there is a print off of the entire index of all the videos that are there because there's over 82 videos there. As you're going through those videos, by all means, please click the thumbs up like button for feedback for our, those who've shared their, their videos, whether they be our partners or ourselves, that feedback is fantastic for us. For the next three days, the live sessions will be hosted under the schedule. So you'll be able to go in there and click the links that have the Zoom link for the one that is appropriate to you. As well on that main page, there is a one page at a glance you can print off or just access for the Zoom links as well. And don't forget that the Jigsaw Learning Team has made themselves available for 45 minute consultations through various intervals over the next three days. So you can go under the consultations tab and click on the person that you'd like to speak with and get some one-on-one -on -one time with our team. And then Thursday, please don't forget to join us for the closing address and for some live wellness sessions prior to that. Uh, in order to be there for the door prizes, you need to be there. <laughs> there are some fantastic door prizes that are being handed out. Uh, thank you to our sponsors and to our partners for being a part of that. And by all means, throughout the course of the next three days, hashtag JLCRS is where the conversation will be. We would love to hear your thoughts and your ideas going forward. Those Thursday well-being sessions, as I mentioned, uh, there's a variety of things that are there, everything from yoga to trivia to uh, an art portfolio that's being put together. So we look forward to that. The closing address will be Thursday at 4.30. There are five main door prizes that are being handed out and Curtis and Lorna would love to have you there to hear the final thoughts on this year's annual symposium, although it's being run in an entirely different format than any of the other ones that we've done. <laughs> 
Uh, at this time, uh, I'd like to acknowledge that while Jigsaw Learning subsidiary company, Jigsaw Collaborative Solutions, owns the WeCollab software that's designed to support collaborative response structures and processes, we are fortunate to also have a partnership with IntelliMedia around the collaborative response module for those dossier users that are engaged in collaborative response as well. This partnership is not only about the companies that are engaging with one another, but the people that are collaborating to support the educational efforts of our partners. And one of those determined and dedicated people is Ahmed Jawad, the CEO of IntelliMedia, and he is committed to working with his team to provide services and solutions that have tangible value for those engaging with IntelliMedia's products. So here to tell you a little more about IntelliMedia and then to introduce Curtis and Lorna to deliver a keynote address is Ahmed himself. Well, thank you, Jennifer. Uh... And thank you for the opportunity. It's exciting doing virtually in person. Maybe next year we'll do this in uh, uh, in person. Can you see my screen first? Yes, we're good. Perfect. So I just want to give you just a little bit about IntelliMedia for uh, some of you who uh, haven't worked with us. Uh, IntelliMedia have been working in Alberta for the last uh, 15 years. Uh, we focus our product on providing uh, product that allow for digitization of processes and collecting data about students for support like the CRM, for example, or counseling or refer uh, systems. Uh, Intel Media have many products and the main ones are Dossier and uh, School Engage. Um, really, when it comes to our focus is in Alberta, but also internationally, we have about 40 school districts in Alberta, uh, 47 of them using uh, basically uh, across Western Canada using Dossier. Uh, school Engage, we have about 22 clients, but also we work a lot with assessments and report card solutions are key to some of the uh, uh, services that we provide to, uh, uh, to our client in Alberta and internationally. Um, dossier uh, basically with started as an inclusive as product and uh, from there we move into uh, education analytics collecting data to support students. Some of that has to do with benchmark, but also uh, in about 2016 we, we work with uh, Curtis and his team and then we built um, the dossier uh, CRM within uh, basically within our product in the dossier um, uh, collection of software. Now uh, in here what I wanted to, to jump I think remind uh, Curtis and Lorna it was 2016 so May almost uh, uh, five years ago so almost the anniversary is coming so that we we, we put it together the uh, the partnership and really what Jennifer mentioned it is not about business, it's about people. And uh, and I'm sure Lorna and Curtis feel that they are part of the community. I'm also, I'm part of this community. So I'm very proud to be part of this community. I'm a parent, I'm an educator in one sense, but also we are here to support you, to ensure that you're able to support students at the end of the day. Uh, what I'd like to do right now is uh, introduce, uh, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Lorna and uh, uh, Curtis. Uh, Lorna Houston is an award-winning um, uh, educator with leadership experience at the school, uh, classroom, districts, and provincial level. Lola's experience have included coaching and mentoring teachers and leaders, effective assessment, curriculum implementation, and inclusive practices at the classroom, school, and district level. She's also the recipient of an Alberta Excellence in Teaching Award as well as elected as provincial chair for the Alberta Assessment Consortium for two terms. Curtis Hewson has been an award-winning teacher, vice principal and principal, as well as taught at the post-secondary level. With over a decade of experience as an administrator, Curtis has championed the call for collaborative structures in schools to ensure success for all students. In addition, to two finals awards from Alberta Excellence in Teaching Awards and Edwin Parr Awards recipient for excellence in his first year, uh, year of teaching, Curtis was an honoree for the ACSD Outstanding Young Educator Awards in 2010. Uh, together, Curtis and Lorna are co-founder and lead learner of Jigsaw Learning, co-author of the text Envisioning a Collaborative Response Model, and currently work with districts and school districts, our schools, uh, provincially, nationally, and internationally, establishing collaborative response framework and interacting with thousands of educators annually. Welcome, Curtis and Lorna. 
thank you so much, Ahmed. We uh, very much appreciate your participation here. And of course, we appreciate your friendship and your partnership as well. So thank you so much for that introduction. We are so excited to be here with all of you today. And uh, knowing that, boy, I, it's been five collaborative response conferences that we've engaged in over the years now, uh, three in person and last year uh, online. And of course, again, this year online, each time it seems like we've done something just a little bit different. So we are just very thrilled that you have come to join us. So what we'd like to be able to do is talk a little bit this afternoon about shifts, shifts and learning that we've engaged in and We'd love to start off by introducing this handsome gentleman here. Uh, for those that don't uh, know, this is Michelangelo, the great Italian Renaissance um, artist. And he has been credited with a Latin phrase, ancora imparo. Now there's a little bit of debate on whether this was something that he uttered at his deathbed, whether it was something that at the age of 87, he had remarked, I've also heard a story that it was something that he scrawled on the bottom of a painting. There's also been debate on, is he actually the originator of this term? But we thought it'd be a good place to start with this Latin phrase, the idea of still I am learning. For someone with the expertise and exceptional skill set of Michelangelo, to be able to say near the end of life, still I am learning, is such a powerful message that really, I think, encapsulates a lot of the work and the sharing that we're going to do with you today. As, as educators working with schools and districts across our province and beyond, we've done a lot of learning through this work and want to share with you some of the ahas that have been made along the way this afternoon. So absolutely, we can attest to that phrase that still we are learning. <laughs> and the whole community of educators that we work with, I'm sure that you would uh, confirm that idea that when you engage in collaborative response, it most certainly is a learning journey. Our journey started in 2006 in a small school in Southern Alberta. And in this school, we had fantastic teachers who adored kids and were doing amazing things in their classroom. And when we examined our data at that time, we started to reflect on the gap that, that was surfacing each time we examined that data, knowing that without looking at individual students, we were most certainly missing a certain group of students consistently year after year. And so we started to explore the idea of what are the structures and processes that we could put in place that would ensure we would meet the needs of all of our students, knowing that a core belief for us is that all students can learn. So how can we provide that system of supports in a way that attends to the needs of every individual student, but as well accesses the expertise that we knew was in our building? So 15 years ago, that conversation started with the understanding that collectively our data is sharing or exhibiting that approximately 90% of our students are having success. And we really wanted to ensure, but what are we doing for the additional 10%? But it was through the intentional structuring of some processes and structures along the way that we actually found out that what was being constructed was about way more than that gap that Lorna described, that 10%. It was really about installing some refined structures and processes that would ensure every student can have success, but doing so in a way that was actually about building the collective capacity, not only within individuals, but within our, our staff team at every level. So as we muddled our way through and put processes in place, we began to, to see success that was happening, not just for that identified 10%, but for a greater student population, but also the staff um, responses that were coming back were really, really quite interesting as we engaged 
in some of this work? So as things began to evolve in our school and we started to learn a little bit more about how uh, these components work together um, and how we use them to support our learners in our school, we started to get requests from other schools, from other um, teachers to be able to talk about what it was that we were actually engaging in. And at that point in time, it was about us being able to put language mm -hmm. to these ideas, knowing that we were grasping at a number of different concepts in a number of different areas. And so how do we explain that in a way to others that uh, would be really understood? And essentially, how could we articulate simplicity with very complex and interrelated um, structures and processes that were being established. So the way we did that is we started out by naming it the collaborative response model, knowing that uh, we knew that it needed to be to be collaborative, there needed to be a component of collaboration within our teams. And it was about responding to the needs of students. So we coined it collaborative response model. And then we looked at what are the collaborative structures that we need to have in place to make sure that we are having intentional conversations about students. And then focusing in on what does our data tell us that we can really use to be able to inform our conversations as we go along. And then finally, how do we provide that support? What are the supports that we provide for our students in using that pyramid of interventions? So it's obviously difficult to see where you're going if you don't have a chance to reflect back on where you've been. So in some of those initial understandings, it, it was quite rudimentary for what it was that we were doing and trying to articulate to others. It formulated um, in 2015, with a book that shared some of those ideas out and understood that those essential components were actually highly interrelated and the connection between them was incredibly important. The learning that we began to engage in when we were sharing it out with others started to really take hold. And as different schools and eventually districts started to see application and value within this framework of learning, it's been over the past six years since the publication of that book that we've really engaged in some deeper thinking and moved well beyond some of the initial understandings in relation to collaborative response. So we moved from having that isolated model, collaborative response model, to understanding that the three components that we were working with initially were highly interrelated. And that we started, we continued to do some learning in those areas and knowing that uh, over time, that thinking has shifted again. And uh, we continue to learn <laughs> as we go through these ideas. So shifting those concepts to collaborative structures and processes, data and evidence and continuum of supports allowed us to think and connect a bigger picture in that deeper learning. And really, um, we, we purposefully created this visual in the, in the form of puzzle pieces, knowing that they are very connected with each other and really uh, are necessary to ensure that we provide all of those supports. So it really has, our understanding has really deepened and expanded and uh, to even from the school provision of supports to how do we use this at a, at a district level. So over the last year, we've been working on a new text and you can watch for that coming out very soon. It should be out in the next uh, six months or so, I would think, hopefully. And so what we want to do today for you is to share some of those fundamental shifts that we've really been learning over the last couple of years that really have changed how we think about collaborative response. Our interactions with... Um exceptional educators across not just our province, but beyond have really fueled these fundamental shifts as we've tried to think about 
what does the work look like in different contexts and and how do we ensure that the structures and processes can be universal in their thoughts so let's go through five fundamental shifts for some of us in the audience these are going to be re reinforcement or confirmation of learning that you've engaged in over the last one or two years for those that have been engaging with us longer this may shift some of your thinking as well in relation to collaborative response. Now you'll notice that Lorna and I through all of these conversations have not once referred to CRM or um, have been talking in regards to collaborative response model in the past tense. This has been one of our key fundamental shift. Fundamental shift number one is the movement from a model to a mindset. And really this began when we started to think about what does this work look like in a school when we're talking across an entire culture of learning and we would have a school say, ah, oh, it's so great to have you in today. You're actually just in time for our CREM meeting. And we'd say, CREM meeting, what's a CREM meeting? Well, you know, our CRM meeting. And what had happened is this framework that is meant to be large overarching frame or approach that we take within a school had been boiled down into a single collaborative structure within the school. So we've been referring within the last couple of years with the idea that CRM is dead. We've, we've moved intentionally away from that to ensure that we're talking about a collaborative response, that it's a mindset, it's a way of thinking about how we organize ourselves in a collaborative manner utilize data and evidence as part of those conversations, and then formulate continuums of support to help assist us in the responses that we plan for students. Collaborative response is a mindset, not a model. So shift number two really comes about with that layering of collaborative structures. And this has been a significant uh -huh for us that when we began this work uh, in, in a collaborative response model, we talked specifically about a collaborative team meeting and the design of that team meeting, what were the uh, in essential components of that meeting and what needed to occur there in order to ensure all the needs of students are, were met. The collaborative team meeting really is the linchpin of the, the entire model, but we now have come to understand that it is uh, essential in the connection of other meetings as well. When we would come into schools and see that the collaborative team meeting wasn't having the same impact that we had seen within our own school, it forced a, a reflection to say, but why? Why is that the case? Because they're following the same types of processes in there. And it wasn't until we understood that, wait, our other layers of collaboration actually contribute to the um, efficiency and efficacy of this collaborative team meeting. So the layering of collaborative structures has been incredibly important for us as we move forward within schools. So that collaborative team meeting taking place about every three to five weeks through a cycle with a defined process and results in a huge amount of, of strategies that influence classroom practice and also influences the supports that we put in place for students, both around differentiation, but also in those individualized supports. So it really becomes the connecting meeting between a number Number of other structures that we have in place, one of which is the collaborative planning team. And that team is meeting weekly, biweekly, or monthly, depending on your schedule. PD days, staff meetings. But this is basically the structure that teachers are coming together looking at their curriculum instruction and pedagogy. And that opportunity to be able to collaboratively plan with your grade alike partners or your specialty alike partners. And and uh, being able to create those pieces that were really important for instruction. But knowing that uh, this is a structure that was greatly influenced by professional learning communities. 
Then the next two structures are actually influenced by special education and the work that has gone on for a long time around providing individualized supports for students, knowing that when we have more intensive needs for students, that it's important for us to create individualized programs. And so we have our school support team meeting and they meet typically weekly or biweekly. And on this team, we have admin, uh, your counselors, your inclusive coaches, your learning support teachers, that kind of school leadership team that meets to be able to talk about individual or sometimes small group supports that we put in place for students. And then we have our case consult team meeting. And that team meeting, of course, is convened typically around crisis or in, in terms of needs for complex uh, situations. So if a student has really intense needs, uh, there is a complexity that we need to be able to invite external partners in occupational therapists, speech, speech language pathologists, the psychologist to be able to meet the needs and to plan accordingly. When we think about these four layers of teams, each of each one of them serves a very different purpose. And it's critical that we define each layer and ensure that we've got a structure in our school that mimics that same parallel to these four layers. Um, we have a blog on our website called Scaffolding Teams. You're welcome to read that. It talks a little bit more about, about these layers of teams. And we have a number of symposium recordings that we've done and resources that go along with that idea. So in practice, let's take a look at what this looks like within a school. And sometimes we, when we look at those four layers, we'll have a school say, well, we don't need that layer because we talk about students all the time. And what we've seen overall is the schools that intentionally build processes and structures in relation to those layers it really beneficial for when we think about how do we enable various teaming structures to respond to needs of students. So I'm going to take you to Elmore School, part of Peace Wapiti uh, Public School Division up in near Grand Prairie. This is a school K to nine of approximately 80 students. I believe there were seven staff the last time I was in there when we counted EA teacher and principal. This is a school that could say, we know all of our students and we talk about students all the time. But when you go into their um, team planning room, we see four posters. First one is defining, when do we come together in collaboration time? Who is together and what's the purpose of that particular type of meeting? Again, as Lorna said, identifying purpose. When we meet in a collaborative team meeting, that's a little bit different. What's its purpose? Who's involved and how frequently does that happen? Recognizing that the same people are likely in attendance in each one of these different layers. When we come for an inclusive education meeting, who is typically involved and what's its purpose? How often is that happening? And then finally, when we need more of a wraparound team meeting, who's involved, what's its purpose that we're able to include? So an exceptional example of a school that um, intentionally scaffolds those layers of team. And now this is where there is a huge connection between that four tiered continuum of supports and our layers of team meeting, recognizing that when we engage in our collaborative planning in the grade level teams, division teams, departments, as Lorna mentioned, we're probably focusing in on tier one instruction. What are the non-negotiables or big rocks that we should see across our our course subject areas, our grade level teams. When we come into collaborative team meetings, now we're examining what are the supports that we put in place in addition to those non-negotiables at tier one? What are the differentiated strategies, accommodations, and interventions that we can put in place? When we engage in that school support team meeting, or as Elmworth calls it, their inclusive ed team, now we're looking at supports beyond the classroom. Supports that are provided by someone other than the classroom teacher, and then finally, when we get to that single student wraparound conversation, this is where we're likely starting to investigate what are some of the external supports that we need to put in place. Really critical understanding of how those layers of team 
intertwine with the tiers of supports that we define within our school. Ensuring that there is a team that is in place to attend to every need of every student in your building. And recognizing then as well that we do not want to see the same student conversation arising in each one. We're able to say where's the most appropriate fit for that conversation when we think about scaffolding or lay, laying on the next tier of supports for student success. Number three, fundamental shift, a focus on key issues. This is a biggie. So we, uh, as we were focusing in on collaborative team meetings solely without the layering of other meetings that were going on, we often heard the question, but when do I talk about Johnny? <laughs> and uh, our response uh, a number of years ago was, well, you know, he, he receives more intensive needs. So uh, in our own school, we would yeah. say, come and talk to us later. <laughs> yeah, after, let's have a meeting after the meeting. <laughs> or, or we would say, okay, well, we could talk about uh, Johnny at, a, at another point in time so we can address his individualized needs as opposed to uh, the, the more comprehensive needs that we were looking at in collaborative team meetings. This fundamental shift really became apparent when we began to work specifically with large high schools where if we're going to talk about a student it's or about a student grouping it's really hard to get everybody who needs to be part of that conversation in the room or when we'd start talking about a student in the collaborative team meeting you'd have several people check out or or even voice i don't know why i'm here the student that we're discussing, I don't even teach. Can I come back when we're ready to talk about my, my students in this? A shift to key issue was critically important, and it's been an absolute game changer. I wish we would have understood uh, 10 years ago. In essence, we were really conducting mini case consult meetings within the collaborative team meeting, or in some instances, we were connecting a number of students to a specific support or strategy. But moving to this process around focusing on the key issues has really made a huge difference and really confirms that idea of collaborative team meetings being that linchpin in the bigger process. Focusing on tier two level supports. So what does this look like? So what we do is in a pre-meeting organizer, we identify students. So each teacher identifies students that they want to bring forth in the meeting. And of course, over time, you want to be able to refer to your data to make those decisions. But you identify a student and then you identify a key issue. Then at the meeting, we have a facilitator who helps to move along this process in starting with one of the teachers. Identify your student, name your key issue. Sometimes your facilitator will need to take a little bit of time to be able to articulate that key issue well. And then we move to who else do we have that is also experiencing that same key issue. What this process does is it allows me as a teacher to say, I'm struggling with this, but when it gets validated, when others say, I do too, here's a student that I'm seeing that. Now, um, it increases levels of vulnerability within, within our team, our collaborative team meetings, and really helps reinforce the idea that we're all needing to learn and continue to grow our practices. But then when we take that key issue and add other students, then the next step is let's set the individual students aside and now we're going to brainstorm in relation to the key issue. If the key issue is that um, started with a student where we're concerned that they are missing critical understandings when it comes to completing assignments, then anyone in the room could identify students within their particular course, grade level classroom that they're also seeing that for then we start a beautiful brainstorm around, so what could we do? And at this point, we begin surfacing all the different instructional practices that people try. Lorna interjects that one of the things I try in my classroom is this. I jump in and say, that's a great idea. What if we took that and adjusted it in this way? What this essentially does is in the collaborative team meeting, makes the conversation about the student brief, 
and the conversation about practice extensive, knowing that in our other layers of the case conference, for instance, our examination of a student needs to go in depth in order to, to understand and properly respond. In a collaborative team meeting, we want the majority of the conversation to be around practice and that we're reviewing our school's continuum of supports as part of that conversation to say, could we try this? What about this? What about this? But that any idea is a good idea. There's no evaluation. There's no judgment. There's no chance for Jennifer to interject and say, yeah, but that idea would never work with the student that I'm worried about. Because once we've collected those thoughts, then we come back to each individual teacher and say, for the student you identified, what's a specific action? you're going to take? What's an idea that you're going to try? And initially, we may see that we stick fairly close to what's comfortable for us as teachers. But through the process and over time, with that higher degrees of vulnerability, we see stretch. We see individuals starting to um, adjust and say, I really like Amber's idea, but I'm not sure exactly how to do that. Can someone help? Uh, could I have some time to meet with Amber so that she can show me that? Could we um, engage in some professional learning around that? It, it really is about using that key issue conversation to impact our practice. The engagement of the team becomes significant. Oh, the, uh, <laughs> we've actually seen physically people who previously, when we're talking about Lorna's student and another person's lean back because it's not their turn to talk yet. When we move into this, we actually see people physically lean in to um, engage because they have something, a strategy, an idea, an accommodation, an intervention that works. Regardless of what student has been brought forward. Mm -hmm. And we, we always think about this as, as a teacher being in the hot seat and everybody else can back away from, from that conversation because that teacher is bringing up the one individual student to talk about. But when we move through this process, we actually set students aside before we engage in that brainstorm. And then it becomes fully about practice and really allows us to build uh, an incredible bank of strategies. And we actually, we record those strategies. We usually recommend to schools that we record those ideas so that in the future you have them as reference. And just think for a first year teacher, what an amazing resource that is exploring these issues that could arise and what are all the things that we can do. But still critically important that we still surface the key issue from the experience of a student, and then to wrap it up, go back to what's an action you're going to do for that particular student, even though we recognize that it is likely going to impact more than just the one or two names identified, but it allows for specificity in the conversation. And then the follow-up to say, when you put that in place for Ken, how did that go? What did that look like? It, it allows deeper levels of reflection than when you did that for your whole class, how did that go? And you hear the response, yeah, pretty good, I think. This also helps us to engage that moral purpose as educators. Why did we come into this in the first place? It was about making a difference for students. And uh, teachers' hearts are in that work in, we name those students, and, and at the end of the meeting, we're coming away with ideas for our students to make that big difference. So uh, number four, number four is about focusing on the yellow. The and yellow. This, is, <laughs> this is really about our data and our examination of uh, data and evidence. Our fundamental shift is about being able to really focus in on the data and analyze and gather that data, data in a way that is usable within our collaborative team meetings and really informs our decisions about students. So when we started early on, we knew that data was going to be an important part of this process. But when we began, we started to gather our data and look at it in terms of students meeting expectations and students who were below. And so basically, basically two. two standards. Who's already made it and who do we have to focus on? And as we began to look at that, we, we saw that, you know, we would look at the yellow and go, well, the, <laughs> these kids are in the yellow for a number of different And reasons. huge range. 
of students from ones that were significantly below where we'd want them to be and those that were close. So over time, we've come to realize that um, using multiple sources of data helps us to understand better what's happening for a student in terms of their overall achievement. And we also have looked at really using four different uh, criteria to be able to analyze that data and really thinking about, um, are they meeting expectations? Are they exceeding expectations? Are they uh, slightly below or significantly below that standard? And being able to color code accordingly. What ends up happening is that we have those four color codes and we have an opportunity to be able to focus on the yellow. And the reason that we wanna focus on that yellow is that of course, there are a few things that we could put in place to bump students into the green, whereas spending significant amount of time and resources in red um, is, a, is a problem for us long-term, knowing that there's a number of structures already in place, number of supports already in place for the, that red category. So this is where a shift can happen then in our pre-meeting organizer. When we, uh, we want people to engage in thinking prior to the meeting, uh, not again, huge make work. The, we've often said that if you need to write more than eight words, you're probably putting too much information on these pre-meeting organizers. But now we can utilize the data to be able to say, who is a student who's close? They're in that yellow range. And what is a key issue that we're seeing? Then also being able to bump to who's a student who's already there, but we'd like to challenge or enrich. And then understanding that we still may want to focus on a particular red student because data is data and it's, it's not perfect, but we also come at it with the understanding that the students who are significantly um, below may have complex needs that are attributing to that, that are actually being attended to through some of our other layers of structures. This is a fundamental paradox in thinking so that we can say in the collaborative team meeting, who are the students who are either close or we'd like to enrich where all of a sudden the strategies, ideas that are being suggested are have a greater chance of impact. I could walk away with an idea that a colleague had suggested, I try, and it works for this student who just needed a bump, who just needed a subtle shift in classroom practice, an additional small group interaction. It really helps build high levels of efficacy in the process when we can say, I tried the things and they worked. I'm, I can't wait to come back and learn more from my colleagues. And again, it contributes then to that, that stretch that we engage in in our own professional, professional learning. If the collaborative team meeting focuses exclusively on students in the red, we often um, hear frustration. We hear, I've tried everything that's being suggested and nothing is working for us. That's again where we want to be able to lean onto our other layers of more intensive supports and structures. So that takes us to our number five shift. And this was actually one that we made fairly early after publication mm -hmm. of understanding that the terminology of a pyramid of interventions actually doesn't quite lend itself well to what it is that we're describing. It, a continuum of supports is much more um, aligned with, with what, what we're sharing. So early on when we were uh, researching ideas for how we would move forward, of course, response to inter intervention was uh, quite big in the States and we were uh, Just doing lots, momentum, yeah. lots and lots of reading and uh, understanding around what was happening for them there. Knowing that, um, that great influence around that uh, pyramid shape allowed us to really think about um, the the majority of our students being having their needs met at tier one and 80 to 85 percent but thinking about that idea of uh, our students being labeled on that continuum we wanted of course to push away from that idea knowing that 
uh, that's not going to get us any further mm -hmm. by, by putting a label on any of our kids. So, so we shifted our thinking from uh, using that pyramid shape about students to about supports. And so it really is about us being able to identify supports that adults in the building are providing. And that's what is tiered, not the students themselves. The pyramid makes sense when you're tiering kids, but when you're tiering supports, as we see in this visualization from our friends at Connaught School in Medicine Hat Public, you can even see in this visual representation of their continuum, even though it's in a pyramid uh, format, if you look at the actual interventions, there's a narrowing that happens at tier one. When we say, what are the big rocks or the non-negotiables that we'll see across all classrooms? When we get into tier two, then we see a bulge that happens. So actually a pyramid doesn't accurately represent what we would see when we're tiering the supports. As you can see in this um, example that comes from Kildare School, Mandarin Immersion in Edmonton Public, when they look at their continuum of support specifically for reading, at tier one, they have six big rocks, six practices that they should see across all classrooms. But when it comes to tier two, now it expands substantially. In fact, it takes over half of the page of all the different intervention strategies and accommodations that we could be putting in place. Then by the time we get to tier three and four, we again see that narrowing as we come down. So we've actually introduced this type of a shape where narrows at the base, bulges at tier two, and then narrows back in. You'll also notice that we've moved away from clearly identifying what's absolutely tier one, hardline, tier two, to more of a graduated response. What's a tier two practice in my classroom? Lorna might be doing that for all students within hers, and we don't want to script instruction. We want to be able to use that continuum as a support resource to help respond to the, when we're not sure where to go next, what could we try? So when we think about um, our layers of supports, if we, without our layers of teams and without that description of supports, then what often happens is that it, if a teacher is struggling with the needs of a student will reach out to have an ed psych done. And we know that there are a number of things in between that could be done to be able to support this student and their individual needs. Before we had clearly articulated and organized the supports across those tiers, it, that was common practice and not through anyone's fault. It's just we hadn't aligned the thinking for how do we, how do we get to that higher degree of intensive supports. And we know that in doing that, we overload those intensive supports and our external partners and our district partners so that uh, it becomes uh, increasingly difficult to meet the needs of every request. Every that referral comes. that's coming up. Yeah. So rather than doing, rather than reaching out to that tier four, and I can say that many teachers do that just because there isn't a description of those teams and layers of support. But what we would rather do is to be able to start at tier one and then add on additional supports as needed. As we identify the things that a student needs, we ensure that that is, is in place as we go along and that it becomes um, a layering of supports and strategies that are needed across across the spectrum, knowing that our kids are really have jagged profiles and this becomes a responsive, flexible way to support the needs of our students. So shifting from a pyramid to a continuum makes sense in, in this regard, but then shifting from interventions to supports also more adequately identify or describes what are all the different things that we can do? And we go back again to Kildare's example where we can identify not just interventions, but strategies and accommodations. There's a lot of things that we can do that aren't necessarily defined as an intervention. Uh, and that was one of our early 
mistakes is referring to everything as an intervention, which was actually quite misleading in our understanding. We wanted to be able to identify that there's a few interventions we have in place, but a wide array of strategies and accommodations. There's, there's a full continuum of supports that we can access when attempting to respond to the needs of our students. So with those five fundamental shifts, we come back to that idea that collaborative response is not intended to be one more thing on the plate, it's intended to be the plate. And the understanding that it becomes our system of, of scaffolded layerings of teams, of intentional structures and supports that really ensures that we're not just being responsive to the needs of students, which is what we thought the initial work was intended to be is let's let's help support that that forgotten 10%. In fact, we had an early article that had that exact title to understanding that it's not just about responsiveness for the needs of students, but that it's engaged and done in a way that builds collective capacity, that builds overall efficacy across our entire team and understands that the expertise, the knowledge, and the practice exists in the room. How do we leverage it to really help ensure that we are providing a collaborative response throughout our school? So over the last year through pandemic, we've seen a lot of different things happening in a lot of different schools across the province and uh, for good reason. Mm -hmm. um, for some schools, it and especially for schools who were early on in the implementation of collaborative response, uh, backed away from those structures and processes, and rightfully so, were attending to the immediate crisis that was facing them. But for some schools, they really leaned in. And what they did was they looked at shifting their times for their meetings and shifting their structure of their meeting, and being able to look at what is the data that we need in these circumstances, and then moved into, so what kinds of supports do we need that may be different from what we were uh, looking at previously, and looking at things like online learning continuum of supports and well-being well mm -hmm. continuums. So how do we use these structures and processes and really collaboratively respond to the needs of our students regardless of the crisis? And we would encourage you over this next year, not knowing what things are going to look like in the fall, but really to lean in, lean into those structures and processes to give you that solid foundation to meet the needs of students, staff, and even leadership. So we'll end with that final thought from our, our friend Michelangelo and Cora Imparo, the idea that still I am learning and how do we learn through this process and grow as organizations, as systems to be able to continue to evolve and ensure that through collaborative response, we are enhancing our learning, enhancing our expertise. And we often say, that we want to get to a place where for you to describe what collaborative response looks like within your building or within your organization, who you better grab a coffee because it's <laughs> going to take some time to describe all the interconnected elements that are aligning to this. Simple in understanding, highly complex in how we actualize. So we encourage you to engage with that model of still I am learning. Thanks so much. And we are super appreciative of the engagement and everyone that's involved in our symposium this year. We hope that it's sensational learning for you, not just during our synchronous, but through all the resources that are available uh, until July 1st. Take care and be safe. So excited to be able to connect with you over the next couple of days as well. Take care. Thank you. Cheryl, we'll turn it over to you. Hello everyone, I'm Cheryl Gascoigne. I'm a learning associate with Jigsaw Learning and I have the opportunity to collaborate with Curtis and Lorna all the time. And yet still 
I am learning. So thank you, Curtis and Lorna, for that uh, wonderful kickoff to our symposium. Thank you for sharing your evolution of your thinking around collaborative response uh, as framed with those five shifts. So that is a very nice lead into our next three days. And along with Curtis and Lorna, I would like to thank all of our partners from near and far. You will see that we have a variety of people um, coming together with us that support this symposium. So thank you to Intellimedia and Jigsaw Collaborative Solutions, as well as our Alberta Regional Consortia. Thank you as well to uh, a variety of contributors to our wellness sessions. So we have Cavaccinos and Gift Smack and Devania Designs all right here in Lacombe. And we have participants elsewhere in our province as well. We have Own Your Own Light Yoga from Sylvan and we have another yoga session as well, Merge with Ange. So we have a variety of participants and partners who make this happen. I would also like to thank our team. We have a very uh, creative team, as you can see this uh, from what began as a in-person conference and it has evolved throughout the years to what you're going to see starting today and over the next few days with this virtual symposium. So a variety of talents and perspectives on this team to um, evolve and hopefully meet the needs of all of you educators who are joining in. And I would like to thank you for that. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your participation. And thank you for your partnership. We really look forward to connecting with you, collaborating with you. And uh, be up bright and early tomorrow morning. We start at 745. There are three formats of sessions to start your day with coffee and some conversation. We have presenter Q&As, we have discussion forums, and we have panel discussions as well. As well as Jen mentioned earlier, our team is available for some one-on-one -on -one consultations. If you'd like to grab a spot such as that to connect and really drill down and answer your questions. So that is it from me. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening and we look forward to seeing you over the week.